I've noticed that when hurricane season arrives, the people where I live, including me, keep an eye on the weather report. Now, I don't live right on the coast of North Carolina, but I'm close enough to have experienced the catastrophic effects that a hurricane can deliver. Everybody wants to avoid a hurricane. Sometimes it just isn't possible. There's not enough time to get out of town. There's, there's less time to prepare in advance. And let me tell you, that's true of the storms of life. Sometimes they hit you with unexpected fury. They just, they just sweep into your life in the form of, uh, of a surprising event, a devastating medical report, some unexpected loss, and, and all of a sudden, life is turned upside down. You don't even have enough time to run for cover, do you? Well, Acts chapter 27 gives us one of the most detailed accounts of a literal hurricane, a storm at sea. And it also gives us some insights on on how we ought to handle the storms of life. Well, you may remember that Paul has appealed his case to the emperor Nero, and he's now departing for Rome. He and some other prisoners are are put in the custody of a Roman centurion named Julius. Uh, Paul is also accompanied by a fellow believer named Aristarchus. Now, we know that Luke is also along for the ride, and that's indicated by the use of the pronoun we as Luke is writing here the book of Acts. Now, these first six verses of chapter 27 trace the journey by ship westward across the Mediterranean Sea, and strong winds eventually force them down around to the southern side of the island of Crete. That's below the Greek peninsula. And there's a harbor there known as Fair Havens. Well, Luke mentions here in verse 8 that the fast was already over. Now, this is a reference to the Day of Atonement. And it tells us that the fall months, the fall season, has arrived. This is the most difficult, dangerous time for sailing on this sea. So it's going, to be, it's going to be a good idea to just sort of settle down there at Fair Havens until after the winter months. Well, evidently, the sailors are ready to push on. They don't want to stop here. So Paul says to them in verse 10, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. Unfortunately, verse 11 tells us the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. Well, I can understand why. These sailors are the experts at this. Paul isn't a sailor. So what would he know? But there's another motive here for moving on. Evidently, Fair Havens isn't all that fair. Phoenix, farther west on the coast of Crete, is is a more desirable harbor and a a lot more comfortable place to wait until spring. So they evidently take a vote here for verse 12 tells us, the majority decided to put out to sea. Well, just like our world today, the majority opinion is absolutely wrong. And it's going to be life-threatening. And by the way, keep in mind, we can create some storms of our own by following the majority opinion or by being impatient or, or maybe wanting personal comfort in life rather than doing something a little wiser. Too often we listen to the experts out there, the sailors. They, they don't have any interest in God. They're, they're not following God's will. And let me tell you, they're not going to make it to Phoenix. Strong winds are going to force them south and back out into the open sea. And this storm isn't going to let up either. Luke writes here in verse verse 18, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. Verse 19, on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard. The storm continues on for many days until Luke writes here in verse 20, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Well, they're now hopeless. They are at the mercy of this hurricane storm. Maybe you're feeling that way today. Maybe hope has abandoned you. Maybe all you can see around you are stormy winds. Well, Paul addresses this 
this crew, the passengers, and he's speaking above the howling wind, if you can imagine it, verse 21, men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete. Well, now this isn't an arrogant, you know, I told you so moment. Paul is effectively telling them, you didn't listen to me before, but I'm going to tell you something and you need to listen to me now. Paul says here in verse 23 that they can remain hopeful. This very night, there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Well, take heart, men. I have faith in God, Paul says, that it will be exactly as I have been told. That's quite a statement, isn't it? That's a very confident statement. And that's delivered, by the way, to a crew of unbelieving pagan sailors. Well, what's Paul's source of confidence here? What kept him from despair? The circumstances? No. Did the wind start to let up? No. It was the word of God, the promise God gave him the night before. Well, the focus of this chapter really isn't so much on, you know, why shipwrecks are allowed by God or why God allows storms to sweep into our lives. Uh, The focus here is really on trusting God in the midst of the storms of life. And let me make some observations. First, Paul trusts God's promise to him. And in fact, in this case, uh, God promised that, that Paul would reach Rome not in a coffin, by the way, but alive and well. His survival, along with all the others, is going to become a wonderful testimony to them that that God is literally managing this storm. Secondly, Paul's example here shows us that storms allow the Lord to, to work through us in ways we could never imagine. Now, beloved, this doesn't mean we're going to go looking for storms. But it it should mean that we can lead others to look for God in the middle of their storm. Well, the remainder of this chapter describes the outworking of God's promises to Paul. And as the storm continues into the 14th day, the ship approaches some land. And Paul again assures his fellow travelers that uh, they're they're all going to survive. He even encourages them to get a bite to eat so they're going to have strength for what happens next. And he he sets the example by thanking God for the food and then beginning to eat. Verse 36 says, then they all were encouraged and ate some food themselves. Well, now at dawn, the next day, they spot a bay with a beach and they direct the ship as much as possible toward it. Luke tells us here in verse 41, but striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. As the ship begins to break up then and the waves as they're stuck out there on that reef, we're told here in verse 42, the soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should swim away and escape. And they certainly don't want to answer later on for any of these prisoners escaping. So the centurion's respect for Paul, however, moves him to prevent this. He orders everyone to swim for for shore, hang on to whatever they can to to keep them afloat. Verse 44 states what would have been simply miraculous. All were brought safely to land, all of them, just as God promised. Now, as we'll learn, this is on the island of Malta. Now, there are a lot of lessons for us here in this historical event. Let, let Let me pull out three of them. First, Life is never free of storms, but God is with us in the midst of them. Those stormy waves that might be crashing over your head today are always under his feet. They're under his control. Secondly, when we're in the middle of a storm, we want the Lord to deliver us. He wants to develop us. We're uh, impatient, aren't we? We we have plans. Well, we're going to get to Rome, but God wants us shipwrecked on the island of Malta. We we want to get to where we're going. God is more interested in who we are when we arrive. And now, third, finally, even the worst storms cannot erase God's plans 
for our lives. Paul is going to reach Rome, but this storm was designed for Paul to reach unbelievers for Christ on the way there. See, Paul isn't shipwrecked on the island of Malta. He is shipwrecked on the island of God's perfect, perfect plan. Until next time, beloved, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.